welcome. Welcome back. Uh, This is the Connect the Dots podcast. My name is Heather and I am your host. Uh, Today is a fantastic day because the podcast is back. Hey everybody, it's been like, I don't know, what, two and a half weeks, two weeks, I don't know, something like that since you last heard me here on the podcast, but we are back. It is season three. Uh, If you are new here, let me catch you up real quick. This podcast started in 2020 as a way for me to share my thoughts and conversations on topics like college, career, customers, and community. In 2021, I took an unplanned break. Life kind of got in the way. And so I put this to the side. And when I was looking at 2022, I knew that I wanted the podcast to come back. So I challenged myself to do 100 podcasts in 100 days. <laughs> it was kind of crazy at the when I when I thought about it, I was like, "Oh gosh, can I really do this?" <clears throat> what, you know, oh gosh, what's it going to be like what am I going to talk about for 100 days? But I did it. I started on January 10th of this year, 2022, and I ended on April 19th. I did 100 straight days of podcast. So feel free to scroll back and catch up after this episode. The 100 days, though, really helped me see what I'm passionate about sharing and what uh, you, my audience, liked to know and like to hear from me. So here we are. We are going to be working through four different themes each month. Uh, This is the first week of the month, so we are taking a deeper look at a topic that has been on my mind, uh, making me ask lots of questions, making me go, hmm, I don't know that, um, I don't know that that makes sense to me. Let me, let me dig in a little bit more that doesn't sit well with me, those kind of things. This podcast, though, is also available in video format, Uh, so it's out on my YouTube channel, so if you're not watching me now, uh, you can hop over to YouTube and see the video, Um, or if you watch video podcasts on Spotify, it's also there in video format, or you can just listen here uh, with me and just the audio portion. So those of you who are watching online, hi, and those of you who are listening Hello. Uh, I'm getting so fancy now that, you know, I only have to do one podcast a week. Watch out now. Now, down to business. This episode of Deep Thoughts, we are diving into a book and an author that has really made me scratch my head a lot. Uh, We're going to talk about Ruby Wax and one of her books that is called How to Be Human, The Manual. Before we jump into the book, um, I do want to take a look at like who is Ruby Wax, because until I read this book, I had not heard of her. Um, and so the information that I'm going to share with you uh, comes from our good friend Wikipedia um, and her own website, as well as an interview article from highprofiles.info. Um, all the links to these are in the description below or in the show notes, wherever you are. Um, uh-oh. So hold please, because if you, if you know me, you know that there's going to be a technical glitch of some sort. My computer has switched to dark mode. And so now I cannot read part of my notes. Let me fix that. Uh, if you weren't here for the um, 100 days of podcast, I did zero editing on this podcast. Uh, this this will have some editing, but um, but sometimes it won't. So just uh, you know, bear with me as I as I just make sure that we okay, we're good to go. Yeah, I can read that. Okay, sorry, y'all. It literally, I'm sitting here talking, and it switched to dark mode. Where are we at? Where am I at here? Okay, yes. Um, who is Ruby Wax? And and by the way, um, I, I do know from um, being, like, doing this research um, over the last, you know, couple of weeks, um, I do know that if you are in the UK, she may be a very well-known name. 
in the UK, or maybe if you are a little older than me, she may be a more familiar name. She, let's just go through who she is. Let's just, let's just start there. So her website, this is the little like tagline on her about page from her website. It says, from the Royal Shakespeare Company to primetime TV, from a master's degree in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy from Oxford to best-selling author, from mental health campaigner to being awarded an OBE for services to mental health. This is Ruby. So Ruby Wax, OBE, I, which is um, an office uh, an honorary officer of the Order of the British Empire, by the way, that is what OBE stands for. Um, <clears throat> uh, Ruby Wex was born on April 19th, so she just had a birthday, uh, 1953. Uh, in, she is an American British actress, comedian, writer, television personality, and mental health campaigner. She is a classically trained actress. She was with the Royal Shakespeare Company for five years, and she co-starred uh, in an ITV sitcom, Girls on Top, from 1985 and 1986. Uh, she was also a writer on um, um, Ab, or AbFab, um, Absolutely Fabulous, and uh, some other things too. So, But Wax holds both American and British, British citizenship all the words today, Heather, uh, and has resided in the United Kingdom since the 1970s. So she was born here in the U.S. in Illinois uh, to um, to her uh, her parents who were from Austria. Um, and then she moved to Britain in um, the 70s. So in 1977, she moves to Britain. She studied at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama, which is now named something else. Um, in 2006, she did a postgraduate certificate in psychotherapy and counseling at Regent's College, which is uh, Regent's College London, which is now Regent's University London. She became a patron of the Charity Depression Alliance in 2009. In 2013, she gained a master's degree in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy uh, from Kellogg College, Oxford. Um, and she has been, again, appointed an honorary officer of the Order of the British Empire uh, in 2015. Uh, this is a special, 2015 special honors for services to mental health. Cool. Lots of mental health, like, focus here. Um, which, having a, a psychology degree myself and being really interested in that piece, I'm all about. All about mental health around here. Uh, in 2015, she was appointed a visiting professor in mental health nursing at the University of Surrey, uh, and she now teaches business communication. I'm not sure how those two things connect, but okay. Um, one odd note from Wikipedia. So in Wikipedia, so again, this information kind of comes from uh, three different places. Uh, her website, Wikipedia, and this High Profiles article. Um, but in Wikipedia, it says that Wax majored in psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, leaving after a year without completing her degree. So I don't know what Ruby got her bachelor's degree in. And maybe that has, maybe that's in when she, she got it in, in acting because she's a cl classically trained actress. So perhaps she has a master or a, a bachelor's degree in theater from the Royal Shakespeare Company? I, I That I could not find. I looked and looked and looked and could not find it. So I'm a little confused is if she didn't finish her psychology degree, how did she go in and get her master's? I'm slightly confused by that. Anyways. Uh, she continued to be a TV writer, editor, and comedian uh, up through 2012, and she still is a, a comedian and stuff too, but that was kind of like when some things shifted. Uh, she did a TED Talk in 2012, uh, which I will link in the notes. Uh, it's a mess of a video. I'm just going to be very honest. Um, so you may want to save those eight and a half minutes and not watch it. It was a bit all over the place. It was a little difficult to follow. 
um, and, and really had like the point of the whole video is that we need to stop um, stigmatizing mental illness. Um, it, it needs to, you know, we need to, to make it um, not a stigma, which I'm 100% on board with that. But just the, the approach to it was very weird. Um, Wax has been open about her own depression. She did make an entire um, online series on mental health issues for the, for the BBC and has worked with mental health charities. In 2010, she did a stand-up show called Losing It, which deals with her experience of clinical depression. Uh, this show, it played in London at the Duchess Theatre in 2011, and she founded the mental health website, <clears throat> which is now part of the SANE, S-A-N-E, mental health charity, in 2011 in response to the audience reaction from her theater show. So in 2013, she published a book called SANE New World, which became a number one bestseller. Um, and it was followed in January 2016 by a mindfulness guide for the frazzled. And in any time that she talks about that book, that book, right? Frazzled. Frazzled. She talks about how frazzled is an actual, like, um, a term. Like, I'd say, um, now I'm losing my words here. Uh, it's like an actual, like, neuroscience term. Um, and so she kind of explains that, which is, it, it's kind of cool, right? It, it makes that connection. And then in 2018, her third book on the subject of mental health came out, which was How to Be Human, the manual, written with the help of a neuroscientist and a monk. So I know I just threw a ton of her history at you. So here's what you need to know. She is, was born in America, but has really lived, has lived in Britain since the seventies. Um, and she does own dual, she does have dual citizenship. Um, she is a comedian. She has been on TV. She has done, um, she used to have a show called Ruby Wax Meets where she would interview celebrities. I'm very interested in trying to find more of these episodes. I found a couple of clips on YouTube, but I really didn't find anything like, I, maybe I just wasn't searching it correctly, but it didn't come up like just, I wasn't bombarded with things when I Googled her or did went on YouTube. So yeah, I'm not sure, but I'd like to watch some of this because she interviewed some interesting people. She interviewed Pamela Anderson and Goldie Hawn and OJ Simpson, um, Bill Cosby, like some, some people like that, you know, now their reputation is definitely different than it was maybe when she interviewed them. She, she interviewed Donald Trump, um, on his plane way, like way back. Um, she interviewed, oh, there's somebody else. Um, I said Goldie Hawn, um, Oh, Carrie Fisher. She and Carrie Fisher were very good friends. Um, and so I would like to see some of that because she, you know, is, is supposedly a very good interviewer. Um, I, I have some thoughts on that that you'll, you'll hear as we talk about this book um, on her interview skills. Um, but here we are. We are now up to the book in, in this time. Um, again, the book was written with the help of a neuroscientist and a monk. And you all know, if you've been around here for a minute, I, I like science. I like research when it comes to things that I read and, and people I follow. I'm very interested in people who, who maybe that's not their specialty, but they reach out and they try to find, like they didn't go to school for that. So they go and they, they try to, you know, associate themselves and find people that are of that, of, you know, of that, um, genre, that, that place, right? Um, so being with mindfulness, right? A neuroscientist can talk about the brain side of things and a monk can talk about the mind side of things. So I think it's a really interesting approach. So I have the physical book. I also got the audio book, um, so that I could listen uh, to the book on a plane. Um, the book is structured with uh, the majority of the chapter being kind of her thoughts and stories, like how she's piecing this information together. And then at the end of each chapter, she has a dialogue with the neuroscientist and the monk. And in the audio version, it is extremely frustrating when you get to those sections because she will cut them off and she will switch questions to the other person. And it's just very distracting. It was very... It, if I didn't have the book, it would have been difficult to follow. So, 
Um, I wasn't a big fan. I don't know if her if her ruby wax meets show is like that, and, and maybe it translates differently in in that aspect. But but on the audiobook, it did not translate well for me. I wasn't a fan uh, of that part of how it was recorded. If that hopefully that makes sense. But again, she's a comedian. Um, her and despite again being born and raised in the U.S., uh, her humor falls very much on the British side of what of British humor. And I like British humor. Uh, usually it is very dry. It can be kind of coarse. Um, and, and I don't mind that. However, with Ruby, honestly, sometimes I don't think it's, I don't think it's humor. It, it comes off as condescending or, or mean or cocky. And it just, for me, doesn't hit me in the right way. So I'm going to share some of this, um, as, as we walk through this book together. Uh, and so you can make your own opinions, uh, and you can read this book and maybe you read this book and you love this book. There are things I do like about this book. I will say that, uh, there were some really good parts and I'll share those with you. Um, but let me stop talking into the book. Let's go. Let's go into the book. Here we go. Let me, there's the book. Okay. Uh, I almost stopped reading this book after page 21. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. It was close. I had to put it down. I had to put it down after, um, yeah, after I read this section. And I reread this section a couple times and, and yeah. Uh, so the first chapter of this book is called Evolution. And Ruby is going through and talking about how we all came to be. So she goes through, um, let's see, the history of us in a nutshell, in a nutshell, right? Um, so, uh, where's the, she goes through like the, sorry. Um, I thought, I thought the sections were, were categorized better, but they're not. Okay. Anyways, so she's going through like evolution, basically. If you know the concept of evolution, that's what she's going through. So side note, if you didn't already know this, I am a Christian and I believe that God made the world. So, you know, see the Bible for more on that. Um, I do not mind people having various opinions on this to each their own but when you say or write something like she did i really again i almost lost it i almost lost it so let me read you what she wrote <clears throat> so she she's going through and, and talking about you know evolution and she gets to this part says this this section is called jesus on the cusp of bc and ad Christ took over and told us he knew what he was doing and we didn't. We were all scum of the earth and natural born sinners, but if we admit our scumminess, we could get into heaven and he'd forgive us. <sighs> Jewish people also feel they've done something wrong, but usually believe it's someone else's fault. They have holidays where they celebrate how badly they've been treated. They have Passover because they have they had to leave Egypt with no warning. They were exiled so quickly, the bread didn't have time to rise. But matzo, to my mind, is more delicious than bread. So what's the problem? At Passover, they believe someone else ripped them off, so they eat horseradish to remind them of their bitterness, like they need reminding. <sighs> yeah. Uh, so some backstory uh, that I don't think I covered before. Um, Ruby is from a Jewish family. Her parents survived the Holocaust. And she wrote, and she wrote this. Um, yeah, but I, I did. I almost, I almost put the book down at that point. Um, because it really, again, to each their own. Um, you know, everybody can have their, their thoughts and opinions, but it, it just, it felt very dismissive to me of, uh, of her heritage. Um, and in, uh, in an interview, I did find in an interview in 2011, so this would be seven years before she wrote this book, she was asked if religion was a part of her life and she responded, no, I wish I had it. It's a really good safety raft. It would have been so easy to be born with religion, but it missed me. 
it missed you? I don't know how that works. How how religion missed you. Um, but if you if you would like for religion to not miss you, um, I would like to introduce you to the Bible. We can have that conversation, Ruby. Um, so I, I just <clears throat> it just really threw me off, especially when I did find out um, in later in the book that that she had. You know, her parents were Jewish. Um, they had, you know, they were survivors of the Holocaust. Um, they, you know, they, and they never talked about it with her. So let me, let me say that. Like, she didn't know that they had survived the Holocaust. She did not know that until she was actually on a show in 2017 or 2018 um, called, I'm going to lose the name of it. Hold on. Um, this show called uh who do you think you are which again i googled and googled i was even gonna pay pay to watch the episode if i could and i couldn't find it because it's the it was the bbc version not the american version so it didn't come up on any of my streaming services or the internet so sorry about that I would have loved to watch it because it's fascinating. Like she talks about it in the book. So the last chapter of the book, she actually takes you like through the whole trip and like what they found out each day. And, and we'll get to that point here in a little bit. But anyways, that, that, that whole just to me, it was just very like, it was just very dismissive to me of, of her heritage of, of the, of the Christian faith, which again, she's not, a. I, I don't believe she's a Christian. I can't find anything that says she is. Um, I can't find anything that says she isn't. Uh, other than this one statement from 2011. Um, where she says that religion missed her. So, Okay. We'll keep going. I won't stay there any longer. Um, so she continues through the evolution timeline. Um, later in the book, she switches from evolution being from like animal to man to now we don't evolve but it's technology that that is doing the evolution for us and it's true technology is always evolving but you can't have us coming from amoebas to and animals to a full stop because technology happened unless the robot population is going to take over and then maybe that's how evolution maybe that is Maybe so. If evolution is true, maybe that is, uh, maybe that is what the next step is. We we just we we the human population dies off and robots take over. I I don't know, but I I find that very odd because she she she's very dedicated to this concept of evolution. Um, you know, at the beginning of the book and kind of setting this up uh, for us, and then in the middle of the book, she she switches. To that now it's technology is is this where evolution is gone we, we've stopped evolving as a human and we've just now left all the evolution up to technology so hmm. again things that make you go hmm uh let's keep moving so obviously ruby is very into mindfulness which is fantastic um i am i am down with mindfulness i so yeah like cool kudos to you I, I like a good meditation I like trying to be mindful about different things um, so the second chapter is all about thoughts and in the conversation that she has with Ash who is the neuroscientist and uh, Tupton who is the monk um, I took away a, a couple things so let me let me just read these here for you so um, they're talking about thoughts and uh, Ash again neuroscientist is Ash says when you're feeling happy you're not doing a lot of analysis about how you're feeling you're just feeling but negative thoughts are different they signal to the brain that there is a problem and resources should be dedicated to fixing it so i think that's interesting to kind of think about how you know when you're happy your your brain's not thinking a lot your your brain just is because that is just the state but when you're hurting or something's wrong that's when it kind of those negative thoughts right it, it kicks the brain into going oh there's a problem we need to find the resources to solve this problem 
Uh, and then uh, Tupton, the monk, says a little bit later in this uh, back and forth um, that with mindfulness, we can start to understand which thoughts are helpful and which ones make us suffer. And we strengthen our ability to let go. We're not usually our own boss. Our mind often goes to places we'd rather it didn't or it wouldn't uh, or <clears throat> wow. Hello, Heather reading the words helps. Um, sorry, I'm going to adjust my lighting a little bit. Ooh, that's going to make me too bright for the video. <laughs> All right, we'll go with it. <clears throat> let me, uh, let me start this over. Let me get a sip of water. Hello. All right. <clears throat> um, with mindfulness, we can start to understand which thoughts are helpful and which ones make us suffer. And we strengthen our ability to let go. We're not usually our own boss. Our mind often goes to places we'd rather it didn't, or it won't do what we want it to do. But now we're getting into the driver's seat. So being mindful, that is putting you in the driver's seat for your thoughts. It's helping you get there. Um, the next chapter is about emotions. And I wanted to read something to you from this page that I <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah here it is okay sorry it wasn't highlighted I had to, I had to check it again um, so this is again from we're talking about emotions and, and this is what Tupton says this suggests that happiness would optimal optimally be our default state okay when we're unhappy, we feel that error signal. So again, kind of building off what Ash, the neuroscientist, had said previously. He says, that maybe, maybe emotions are signaling to us that we're off balance. And we tend to feel sensations in specific locations when we're upset. But happiness isn't, e isn't easy to locate. It feels more generalized as if it's natural. Um, and so they're having this conversation about like where you feel. So if you think about like emotions, where do you feel stress? Um, you know, I, for me, when I get stressed or, um, you know, I feel it kind of in my shoulders, they start to cramp up. If I feel embarrassed, um, or, um, you know, maybe, um, a little, a little shy, you know, my, my neck might get red or my face gets red. Um, so I can feel those kind of negative emotions, whereas, right, happiness is kind of that default state, right? It's it's not easy to locate um, in your in your body. So I kind of like that, like thinking about it like that a little bit. Um, the next chapter is about the body, and uh, Ash, the neuroscientist, um, I, I like I like how he kind of puts this together. Uh, he said a spider web is a great analogy. When an insect gets trapped anywhere in the spider's web, every single string of the web vibrates. The spider can feel that vibration from any point. The brain and the body are like that. They are totally interconnected, a single system. Anything that affects one part of the whole system and it all vibrates together. So I, I like that analogy of how our, our brain and our um, bodies um, are, are connected like that. I mean, you, you know that, right? Obviously, right? You've got your central nervous system, all of those things are together, but thinking about it like a spider web, like if it's an emotion, if it's pain, if it's, um, like I got a massage today and you know, the, just the feeling of that kind of stress relief, right? When, when the muscle that's tense lets go, right? That, I can feel it kind of all over, kind of, you know, resounds throughout the body. So I, I get the spider web analogy. I get that. All right, let me go. What's the next chapter? All right. Um, so this is actually a part that she wrote. Um, this is not an interview part, uh, but this is about compassion. So the next chapter is, is compassion. Um, and it's talking about having compassion for like self-compassion, right? Self-compassion comes first is the, is the title of this particular section I'm going to read from. It says, people who have more self-compassion find it easier to apologize and admit they've done something wrong when they've made a mistake. 
Their sense of self-respect isn't threatened because they don't intrinsically think of themselves as a bad person or a failure. If someone doesn't have self-compassion, they'll usually get furious if you point out an error because it stokes up their feelings of not being good enough. If you go back to some of the episodes in the 100 Days where I talked about perfectionism and shame and burnout and um, those types of things, you know, it's, and, and there will be an episode coming up where we talk about imposter syndrome. And I, I think like this kind of, this topic makes me think about that, right? If, if you don't have compassion for yourself, it is very easy to get mad at yourself when you make a mistake. It's very easy to, um, you know, kind of beat yourself up a little bit internally. You know, you that internal voice is like saying things, you know, to you and, you know, you can get furious with yourself, but having that, um, you know, that, that self-compassion makes it easier to admit when you've done something wrong or you've made a mistake. So I like, I like kind of, you know, thinking about that and making sure that, you know, I have compassion for myself. Like I do compassion for others. Um, and then she, um, then there's a section that talks about compassion in the brain and, um, says here are some suggestions to help you kind of rewire your brain, um, help someone you don't know, be happy for someone when they succeed. Yes. Yes. Let's be happy for people when they succeed. Um, you know, build, e build each other up that, that whole thing of, I see, you know, people on, on LinkedIn all the time or, you know, they got a new job. Let's, you know, let's celebrate that. But let's also, I put a post out, I don't know, it's probably been a month ago now, uh, or maybe over a month where let's not just celebrate the big things like getting a new job. Let's celebrate the little things. Let's, let's be happy. Let's celebrate the joy, um, and, and be happy for, for someone when they succeed. So. Uh, the next one is say sorry if you interrupt your husband or wife for the thousandth time. I try, I try not to interrupt, but sometimes I do. And I try to apologize when that happens, whether it's my, whether it's my husband or it's a friend or it's a coworker, I do try to apologize. Um, let someone jump in the queue or line, uh, in front of you. So I, I think about this when it comes to traffic. Um, since I, I mean, I've, my, my road rage has definitely lessened a lot over the years, especially since working from home. Cause I don't drive that much. So I just kind of like, well, you know, it's what, it's what it is. Um, but definitely since I've moved to Florida, I just don't, I'm just like, whatever you people are crazy. I'm just going to drive myself. I'm just, I'm going to, here I am. I'm in the right lane. Uh, I'm going to turn my blinker on when I need to turn. I'm not going to rush to the red light. I'm not going to, you know, zig, zig in and out of traffic. I'm just not going to let you upset me. Mm, no. Um, <laughs> so uh, she says, we do, we need to learn how to do compassion. It won't grow by itself out of our neutral, out of our neural jungle. Um, if we don't learn it, we'll go back to our very destructive and violent default mode. And she talked about that in the evolution chapter. Um, it says, anytime you're moved to do something to help, that's enough, right? So just, if you're moved to help somebody, do it. Um, in the interview section, the, uh, the monk, uh, so Tipton says, compassion isn't something soppy. It's actually very brave because you have to look at yourself honestly. You need to be willing to face your pain as well as the pain of others instead of burying your head in the sand in avoidance. That, that makes me think about, I was talking about this today um, with, with Jay and how I have, I have tended to like, there's some, I've, I've, there's a particular, you know, kind of situation, um, in my life where I have, I've probably not been willing to face the pain, um, or, or go to that, um, that place of, um, 
you know, I've been burying my head in the sand. I've been avoiding because I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Um, and, and so I get, I get that, um, that, that it is brave, like to look at yourself honestly and be like, Hey, you know, you really gotta, you gotta really face up to that. Right? You gotta go, go take a look, take a look at that. Uh, the next chapter is all about relationships. And so, uh, Tupton, obviously I relate to a lot of things Tupton says. I, I like Tupton. Uh, he's, he, again, he's the monk. <laughs> uh, when they're talking about relationships and, and attachment, he says, attachment is often based on need. The problem is the more we grasp, the more deficient we feel. It's interesting how people say, you complete me. Aren't you complete? If you need someone to complete you, then you're making yourself less than you are, and you'll always feel there's something missing. But if people can share happiness, that's a different story. Then it can work. Actually, there's no such thing as a perfect relationship. All we can do is to make the decision to put in the work. A relationship isn't a thing. It's something you do. So I want to break this apart. Uh, for for a minute, because I really I really kind of like this this thought, right? Where you say you complete me, right? But aren't you already complete? Um, we are each complete people, um, and you know if you've got if you're looking for that kind of person to complete you, um, which is you know obviously a very um, a, a very iconic movie line. Um, <laughs> But if you are looking, if you're looking for that, right, you, you are making yourself less than you're saying, I, I am not good enough unless I have someone to complete me. You are good enough though. You are, you're, you're complete. You need that you, if you want to have somebody, you want that relationship, you want to attach with somebody, then it's sharing happiness. I love that thought that a relationship is sharing happiness with someone. It's not necessarily, um, you know, you completing me. I was missing this part of me. No, I was, I was, I was complete, but I needed this per. but, but you help me, you know, to, um, to share happiness. We share happiness together. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that Jay and I work so well together is we do, we share a lot of happiness together. Um, and again, a relationship isn't a thing. It's something that you do. You have to work on your relationships. That is so key. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a, um, we're going to get married and everything's going to be hunky dory and it's great. And we're never going to need anything else. It's going to be wonderful. Wonderful. No, it's, you have to work on it. It's something that you do you do, you're actively in, you're actively in a relationship, you're actively married to somebody. You are, you have to put in that work to keep that going, to keep that shared happiness, to keep that shared interest. You, you got to work on that. It doesn't just come because you've committed to that person. You, you have to work on it. I could talk about that for a long time. Let me move along. Uh, then he also says, I think the work is about becoming more self-aware, blaming the other person less and having more compassion. It's about mutual respect. If we don't start owning our own stuff, the whole thing starts to crumble when the chemicals die off. Such a good point. Mutual respect for each other and own your own stuff, right? Like... I know when I had some, you know, some, some health issues, you know, back at the end of 2020, um, and it was, it was a really scary time, um, for, for myself. Um, and, and I know it had to be for Jay because of what happened, but, um, with me and, you know, if, if I'm not going to, I've got to take care of myself. Um, cause if I'm not, if I don't own my own stuff, if I don't remember to fill my medication, if I don't remember to go to the doctor or, or do whatever I'm supposed to do to take care of me, then that's when things start to crumble, right? Because that, that kind of honeymoon phase that you have right at the start, it, the, the chemicals die. 
they, they can die off. I mean, you, you still get them, but it's not the same, right? Again, relationships are something that you do, not something that just is. It's not a thing. Okay. <laughs> um, now, all right, so we've had a lot of good stuff so far. Mm. I'm sorry. We, we had some, some things that were like, uh, excuse me. And then we had some things that I was like, okay, I'm, I'm here with this. I agree with this. I understand this. This is helpful. This, these are helpful things on how to be a better human. Yes. Down with this. So now we're going to get into a chapter. This is chapter 10. It's called the future. Um, yes. So, um, don't want to read this whole, this whole paragraph. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I will, because it'll set some, it'll set some context for why this upset me so. And you can agree with me, hopefully. Um, so this section is called New Evolution. It says, in the past, we evolved primarily through our DNA. Each time the world threw a new challenge, yelling, okay, sucker, how are you going to cope with this one? Our genetic makeup mutated to make sure we'd be able to see the next new year. Evolution has always come to the rescue. For example, about 10,000 years ago, to ensure the survival of the Australian um, aboriginals living in the desert climates, a genetic variant developed that meant man could now survive in boiling temperatures and take on a tan like nobody's business without burning. Another example is that, again, around about 10,000 years ago, when we morphed from being knuckle dusters to stand, standing uppers, Europeans and Africans were the same dark color. Both came from the motherland, Africa. A big sorry to the fine racist, racist of Alabama. Hmm. <laughs> Over time, human skin in less sunny northern climates grew lighter to help people absorb the sun's ultraviolet, ultraviolet rays and synthesize vitamin D more effectively. Finding out that the color, finding out that the color they are is only because of the direction their forefathers walked is walked in has bummed a lot, bummed out a lot of bigots. Now, I read this and <laughs> you know I, I just like, again I think it's <sighs> now I, I'm not defending I'm not saying that there aren't racist and, and that bigots don't think this way I'm not saying any, any of that I, I that's not what concerns me about this per se uh, I think it's just the way that it's that it's written and it's written in a way that it's supposed to be funny you know well a big old sorry to the racist of Alabama why don't you just leave that out I mean yeah, just, just leave that out, right? You could have just said, when we morphed from being knuckle dusters to standing uppers, Europeans and Africans were the same dark color. Uh, both came from the motherland, Africa. Over time, human skin in a less sunny northern climate grew lighter to help people absorb the sun's ultraviolet rays and synthesize vitamin D more effectively. Why couldn't we have just said that? Like, I, I just don't feel like... I, it's not funny. It, it's not needed. I, I don't know. Maybe it didn't hit you as, as you know, I, I I just, it just felt very odd to me when I read it. And I, I, I just was like, and, and I've got some thoughts towards, towards the end that I'll, I'll talk about because, you know, this book was written in in 2018 or 2017 published 2018 and, and so maybe then it, it wouldn't have come off as, as so bad i would hope it would 
<laughs> there are parts of it I'm like, that really would, shouldn't have worked ever. That, that should have never been something that you put in the book. Um, but yeah, I just don't... I think that there's a way to make your point without without that. Like, I just don't... Why? Why is it, th why is it there? I, I just... I don't know. It was it was a little offensive to me. Uh, it, not offensive because I want to, you know, I, I, not offensive because I I don't want to offend racists or, or bigots because no I don't. But I just felt like as a person I was just like, why why is it needed? Okay, I gotta get off that point. I could talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm getting off that point. Ugh, I gotta keep moving on because we still got some to do and I don't even know how long I've been talking. Oh, 46 minutes. Cool. Thanks for staying around. Hi. Um, let's see. Um, next up. Oh, we're still in the future. Okay. Now, now, so this is interesting. So she, she says this part is called my conclusion. Uh, and it says the drawback is that we might get so addicted to the next big thing that we lose who we are and just end up being out there communicating with virtual friends and families. I hope we don't feel too lonely not being near real flesh and blood humans, but I'm not but I'm sure there will be some pill to take or some implant to implant if that happens. And when I read this, it, it, I read it a couple of times um, when, when I was when I got to this part, right because it talked about you know communicating virtually with family and friends and I hope we don't feel too lonely. Uh, not being near real flesh and blood humans. And in this book, again, written in 2018 or, or 2017, published 2018, is, I mean, it, kind of like a little bit like we, we lived through that. Kind of still living through that with, with COVID. I mean, where we were communicating virtually. Um, and I know people felt lonely. I know people feel isolated and and getting accustomed to the, the virtual world was was hard. Even though I worked virtually, it, it's it was still hard to to transition in, into that kind of space and, and still stay as connected as I wanted to be with people. Um, and then she did say something that that I that I agreed with um, here in this chapter. She said, "Unless we train ourselves to focus intentionally." on what we choose to focus on, and hopefully it's things that make us feel good, will be in a constant state of distraction and dissatisfaction. So training ourselves to focus intentionally on what we choose to focus on, um, to keep ourselves out of a state of constant distraction and dissatisfaction. What does the neuroscientist say about the future? He says, we're human because of our social connections, how we interact with each other. We see ourselves through other people's eyes and that changes our behavior. I don't think we can replicate that with technology. I would agree with that. The monk says, um, the need to look at solving the world's problems, not just making tech for tech for the sake of tech. There needs to be a compassion and ethical motivation. Um, so, you know, when, so he's saying when he talks to big tech, tech companies, he tries to emphasize that they need to look at solving the world's problems instead of just making tech for tech. I get that. Um, he also, Tufton also says in terms of the future, we keep talking about getting more advanced, but what do we mean as a species? Are we becoming happier, kinder, wiser? What we need, what we now need is to evolve our minds, upgrade the software. Maybe that's why mindfulness is so popular now. I love that thought, right? As a species, are we becoming happier, kinder, and wiser? I like that thought. I hope so. Now in this book, there is a chapter 11 is, is mindful, mindfulness exercises. So I really think that this is cool because every chapter has a, a, a coordinated um, set of mindfulness um, exercises. 
um, to it. And so Tupton gives you his exercises and then Ruby gives you her interpretation of, or how she, um, you know, how she would do it. Um, I'm trying to find one because I, I know I wrote a note on one of these. I'm trying to find it so I can share it with you. Would you like to hear the clicking of the pages or not? Oh, maybe was it this one? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's in a different one. Okay, never mind. Okay, we're gonna continue on. Okay, so, so, so you have the the mindfulness exercises there, and then we have um, the the last chapter um, is called forgiveness, and so this chapter takes you through her journey on the on, on the show. Who do you think you are? And it talks about after her mother died, she found an old leather suitcase in the attic that she must have brought to America with her when she escaped from Vienna. Um, and it was full of hundreds of letters and photos and she had no idea who any of them were. And so that's how the, that kind of the initial meeting came up with the show. Who do you think you are? Is they helped her kind of navigate this and figure out her history because her parents didn't talk about it. And, and I can... I mean, I, I can understand. I mean, why they they wouldn't talk about it? Um, so, uh, so she she walks through like every day that they're you know over there and and working on this stuff. Um, and again, this is one of those things. This is where she says one of those things that I go seriously. Like, why did you even need to say that? Why was that needed? Um, <laughs> And so she's day eight, July 5th, a day off filming. I visited my mother's house. Now a small food shop run by a Muslim. Oh, the irony, the new scapegoats. Like, is that supposed to be funny? Cause it's not, it's insensitive. It's stupid. And it should have been taken out of the book. I, just like the the comments about the racist and bigots it didn't need to be there. It added no value to this book. Zero value. Why'd you put it in? I, I, it just it just makes me go. Mm, mm. I liked you for a minute, like you were doing good, and then here we go again with something extremely. Oh, just in just extremely. I don't know. I, it just can't think of the words to say at this moment, but I don't, I don't appreciate it. Um, in this chapter in forgiveness, when you get to the, the part of the, um, where they, where they do the interview. So, um, Tupton says, I think we worry that forgiveness means we're letting someone get away with something, but it's more to do with releasing ourselves from the burden of resentment. And I have heard this so many times because there, there are definitely things in my life where, you know, I've, I've kind of not wanting to forgive someone because I feel like, um, like, like I'm letting them get away with whatever they did. Like, but they did this to me and I'm not going to forgive them, you know, and just standing my ground on it. And, and really it doesn't help, you know, I it really, if, if I want to really, you know, let that go, um, it, it, you know, when I forgive them, it releases me from that burden. It doesn't mean that I forget. It doesn't mean that I don't learn from that situation, but it just means that when I, I release myself from the burden of resentment, the neuroscientist, uh, so Ash says, vengeance may be sweet, but anger and fear are potential activators of the limbic system. That's the more primitive part of the brain, which, as we said before, activates the fight or flight response. And holding on to anger or fear is a chronic stress. It promotes the production of poisons like cortisol. It's terrible for the brain and body over the long term. Holding on to anger or fear is a chronic stress. We gotta let it go. Gotta let it go. Uh, Ash goes on to say, the brain has to, has to do two things in forgiveness. First, it has to temporarily suppress the feeling of anger that's happening, mainly in the right 
uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the brain region that puts the brakes on cognition. Then there's a network between the frontal cortex and the uh, perennial cord. That's not the word. Uh, peritoneal. <laughs> I can't say it. Oh my gosh, I can't read it. Um, the peritoneal. Peritoneal. Periton. Anyways, another cortex in the brain. Obviously, I'm not a neuroscientist. Um, that updates your uh, your perceptions. That allows you to get out of your rigid view of blame and the anger and stress can dissipate, right? So, so you do two things, right? So you have to first suspend the temporary feeling of anger. Um, and then there's a network between um, those two cortexes that can open up and update your perception. So, um, let's see what else. Oh yeah, forgiveness in here too. Ah, ooh, yeah, this this part, this was good too. Um, so ooh, this is Ash again. He says, we're tribal animals, so we define people as either in-group or out-group. We don't see out-group people as fully human, and that enables us to treat them in horrible ways. The important thing is that this can happen to any of us at any time if the circumstances are right. When an authority figure whips up enough hatred for the out-group, it pulls together the in-group and incites them to violence. It's not, and it's not all at once. Usually it's one little step at a time. It's like when people start a sentence with, I'm not a racist, but you know what they're going to say will be racist. It's the start of losing your moral compass. When I read that, my note to the side is like, it sounds like January 6th where when, when you have such a, a, a divide where you, you start to see people as in group and out group, oops, sorry, it's probably loud. Um, when you start to see people as an in group or out group, you are this or that, you, you know, not, you're not a human, you are a, a Democrat or you're a Republican, you are, you know, pro Trump or you are not. You know, when you when you start to divide people on such a line where it's it's one or the other, you can't, you know, you're you're not a human anymore. You're this or you're that. No no questions asked, right? If you're this, I don't like you. If you're that, you're great. Um, and that's what that's what's happened. And so I think it's very I think it's a, a really good thing to kind of think about is is when that happens, when you only have an in-group or an out-group, you start to see the out-group as not fully human, which gives, which breaks it down and says, hey, I will treat you whatever I want, way I want to, because you're the out-group. You're not human. What are you talking about? Um, and that's, you know, that again, comes down to things, you know, that are, um, not just politics, race, um, that has, you know, been seen time and time again in history where people have been like, you know, in group, out group, um, you know, insert whatever, you know, black, white, um, you know, Muslim, not, you know, Christian, what, whatever, in group, out group, you know, it's, that has been seen over and over again when you start to say you are this and I am this, I am in and you are out, then you start to see that other group as less than. And that's when, that's when, again, those little things can start creeping in and you, you think, oh, this, you know, what I'm doing is not bad. Well, maybe today, maybe you just put something up on Facebook that maybe is insensitive or you write it in a book. Um, but then over time, then what is it? Then what comes next? And then after that, and then after that, it just, that, that particular part really just was like, what, like, like, yeah, like we, we've got to stop seeing, we had to stop seeing the, the in group and out group and start understanding that we're human you are a person and I am a person and, and we have things that, you know, we, that we may look different, sound different, think different, believe different, and that's fine. But guess what? 
we're both human and we can find that connection there. We don't have to be the same. I would prefer us not. No, I would prefer everybody like it is, right? Like we're, we're, we're all a little different. What a boring world it would be if we were all the same. Like, come on. I, yeah, I, I just, that, that again was one of those things that, that really just sat with me and, and like, again, deep thoughts. That's why these, that's why this is so long. <laughs> Thanks for staying. Um, in the mindfulness exercises for forgiveness, um, it talks about in here, um, this, this one exercise, um, Tupton is saying that with mindfulness, we start to understand the human condition. Nobody is out to get us. They're simply consumed by their own pain and ignorance and very often can't control their words or actions. It doesn't mean we're condoning what they do or allowing it to continue. It's about shifting our attitude of resentment and dropping the burden of hurt and rage. So that kind of goes back a little bit to uh, what, what I was saying like before I got on the in-group, out-group thing is forgiving someone, letting that resentment go doesn't mean we condone what they do or allow it to continue it's just shifting our attitude of resentment and dropping the burden of hurt and rage. Um, and again, this is this is the one I was looking for earlier. So at the end of the mindfulness exercises, each one, Ruby gives gives her take on it. And so Ruby's exercises uh, for forgiveness, um, mindfulness exercises is just simply, I can't think of a better exercise for, for, for forgiveness than getting booked on who do you think you are. My note to myself when I read this was, answers like this feel condescending and full of privilege. Not everybody has that privilege, ma'am, to go on a TV show for 10 days and have their life dissected for them. Even though if you read the story, it's very, it is, it is heartbreaking. Like it is to, to find out the story of her history and, and the things that she found out. It is very moving in the things that she, like her family went through and her relatives went through. Like it is a very, it, for her, I'm sure was a very therapeutic process of, of figuring out some things about her past. But again, she's probably writing that to be funny. It doesn't come off funny in print. It comes off as privileged. And yeah, that's my thought. Um, it, yeah, and then I'll, um, and then, and then I'll say this to the, the thought about the kind of this comment around the, the privilege thing. I'm sorry, I keep hitting the thing, the mic screen thing. So sorry about that. Um, in this kind of like cocky, arrogant thing that she, that she has put out a couple of times in this book with statements in her acknowledgements, it says, um, I said it in my, in the acknowledgements for my last book, Frazzled, and I'll say it again for this book. No one helped me write this besides my editors, Joanna and Ed, the monk and the neuroscientist. Besides them, I thank my publisher, uh, from Penguin for publishing and my agent uh, for agent for agenting and for both women uh, being generally fabulous. Outside of them, no one, not even a mouse, showed up to help me write this. I have only myself to thank. I, I mean, yes, congratulations. You wrote a book. This is your like third or fourth book. Good for you. I haven't written a book. But, like, really? I don't know. It just, again, I, am I, maybe it's just, I don't get the British, like, the, the, the harshness of her British humor, or, or, or maybe in, in 2018, I, I would have read some of these things differently, or not taken them as, as harshly as I, as I take them today, but, Yeah. Okay, so I have a couple other things. Thank you for sticking with me. Um, I, I will wrap up kind of my, my thoughts around around this at the end, but I have a couple more things like I want to want to kind of talk through because um, I did a good bit of research 
in when I was watched like recent videos I listened to some podcasts that she was on I read several articles I read read her website like I really tried to dive in and gather as much information as I could before I sat down to record this and there are just a few other things that I want to chat about she talks a lot about mindfulness and mindfulness can be one of those terms that you know you know what it is somebody says oh mindfulness yeah and you're like oh yeah I got that but sometimes we struggle to understand or remember the true meaning or use because it's become a buzzword right mindfulness is very much a buzzword uh in my thoughts right I see it a lot on on social media and that kind of thing so um, according to psychology today mindfulness is a state of active open attention to the present this state is described as observing one observing one's thoughts and feelings without judging them as good or bad and again like I've seen a lot of talk about mindfulness on social media and I agree that mindfulness can be helpful in a lot of ways um, and the article from Psychology Today goes on to say, mindfulness is frequently used in meditation and certain kinds of therapy. It benefit, its benefits include lowering stress levels, reducing harmful rumination, and protecting against um, depression and anxiety. Research even suggests that mindfulness can help people better cope with rejection and social isolation. These are all good things. Mindfulness is a good thing. Uh, I, I, I really do think it is. I think that some of these mindfulness exercises that are in this book are really good things to think through and work through. And that's why, like, I won't discredit this book completely. Um, because I will, like, go back and I'll, I'll look at some of these mindfulness exercises because I think it is something that could help me. Um, in uh, 2017, Ruby did an interview with uh, HighProfiles.info, uh, which I... I quoted some things from there earlier but here are a couple other questions that kind of go around this this mindfulness um thing uh, or the topic of mindfulness and therapy the the interviewer says you've talked in the past about therapy does it help you see where the rage comes from ruby oh i don't need someone to talk me through where it comes from and if I think about it, it fuels the rage. But if I just feel the rage and sit with it, then my body picks it up and can deal with it rather than me ruminating about it. The interviewer, is therapy still part of your life? Ruby, well, no, because mindfulness is a way of tuning in every day and just watching what's going on and then accepting it. And that's what, my, that's what therapy is pretty much interviewer so mindfulness actually Ruby is a therapy and anyone can do it so Ruby is does have her degree in in mindfulness cognitive uh, therapy um, mindfulness is not a replacement for therapy I, I'm just gonna put that out there uh, if you have if you need to, to if you need to talk to somebody, if you need to really work through things, you can't just mindfulness your way through that, through, through it. Um, if you've gone to therapy and you've worked with a therapist and you've learned how to be mindful and, and you've been, you know, you've finished your treatment and, and you say, okay, yes. And you've continued to work through mindfulness and use it as, as part of your, you know, your kind of daily therapy. I think that's great. But it's not something you can just pick up and be like, okay, because guess what? You may need medication. You may need a different kind of therapy. You may need to talk with, it's, you can't just say, you know, it, it's, uh, I, you know, you can't just be like, it's therapy. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. But, but it's not a replacement for therapy. And that's how the, the way that she, it's, it's now become her replacement for therapy. And that's fine. I just think she needs to call that out a little bit better in answering questions. Then a little bit later in this interview, uh, the interviewer says, the self-help industry has become huge, hasn't it? And Ruby says, well, 
Sorry, hold on. <clears throat> um, the interviewer says, the self-help industry has become huge, hasn't it? And Ruby says, well, I have to make a distinction. To me, self-help is more than hug your angel or wish for something good. There's a difference when someone uses scientific evidence, even in comedy. I think I am taking from some really fine minds. Interviewer, one of the dangers of the industry is that it needs to keep people dissatisfied to keep going. And so it creates its own sort of striving. Ruby, yeah, definitely. If you're not positive, you're wrong. Uh, interviewer, do you... Do you find it hard to write about mindfulness without encouraging a new sense of striving that creates new possibilities of failure? And Ruby says, that's the downfall of that. Yeah. But if someone's doing yoga and they do a back bend and they break their spine, I would assume they're doing yoga wrong. You know what I mean? I'm not in charge of how you take it. If you say I've meditated for eight hours, well, good luck. Being mindfulness is anti-striving. So, let me deconstruct this for a second. So, yes, uh, you know, the self-help industry uh, has become very big. Um, it's lots, lots and lots of talk about it on social media. And this, then this interview is from 2017. So, like, it's... It's even taken on a whole new kind of thing since the pandemic. Like, it's, it's so much. Um, so when, you know, when she talks about, like, do you find it, when they ask, you know, about do you, the dangers of the industry is that, you know, it needs to keep people dissatisfied to keep going. Um, and, you know, she says, if you're not, you know, yeah, because if you're not positive, in quotes, right, you're wrong. That's the culture of toxic positivity, um, which we're going to get into, I think, next month. I think next month is when we'll get into toxic positivity. But um, it is, yeah, like, if you're not positive, then you're just wrong. Like, you have to be positive all the time. Choose choose joy. Choose joy. You will, you will hear me talk about my journey with toxic positivity and being that person when we get to that, when we go through that episode. So, I will... I will eat all the crow. <laughs> I will apologize for all of the things. I promise. Because I know I was that person for a, for, for a while. Um, I am still a very positive person. I am still a very joyful person. I still believe in those things. Um, but it's, it's the, the toxicity of it that, that can really get you, um, into, into this cycle. Another, another podcast, Heather, stop. Um, <laughs> But, but then she says in here, right, um, when, when he asked her, you know, did you find it hard to write about mindfulness without encouraging that new sense of striving? And she was like, well, I'm not in charge of how you take it. I'm not in charge of how you take it. No, she's not. She, she is not in charge of how I took this book. This is, it's not her fault, I guess, that I was upset by some of the things that she said. Though I feel like an editor should have said, I don't think that that's necessary and you should take this out of the book, but whatever. I'm not the editor. Um, but I just feel like that's a very, again, you know, 2017 to, to 2022, five years of all the things that have happened, right? I think now, no, you're like, if you take this video a certain way, I can't help that. But what I can do is try to make sure that what I tell you is backed up by by facts or I tell you where I got the information. I, I, I read it from, from the book where it was said. I, I, I try not to just be like, here are all the rainbows and unicorns. I, like, I try to give you a, a realistic, you know, look at kind of how my thought process, um, of things, but 
I don't know. I, I don't know. It just, again, it's one of those things. Like when I did this research, there was a section in my notes called things that didn't sit right with me. <laughs> and that's where, that's where this, these things lived. That's where these lived. So I've got another interview from 2011 where again, says some really odd things. So there's been 11 years since this and the, the world is such a different place. And I know that people can change. People can apologize and people can grow. I have apologized for things that I have said. And let me, again, when we get to toxic positivity, I mm, no holds barred on my own self. We're going to reflect on some of Heather's past. No holds barred on myself here. But when, when you hear what she says in the past... Even the way that, that she's interacted, again, in a few of the videos and podcasts that I've watched that are, are, are more recent, you know, within the past year or so, it, it still makes me go, hmm, really? That's okay. Um, <laughs> like, it still makes me just question. So, this is, again, from 2011. Um... The interviewer asked, did the pressures of being on television, of being a celebrity, contribute to the problem, meaning her depression? And she said, it doesn't, it doesn't make you break down. It's a coincidence. You don't get it from something unless you were a soldier or around during 9-11. Say what? So, excuse me? <laughs> what did you just say? So this is how I interpret this answer. She's being asked, did the pressures of television contribute to her depression? And she was like, nope, it's just a coincidence. You don't get depression. You don't get something. You don't, or you don't get it from something. So you don't get depression from being a celebrity. Um, so you don't get depression unless you're a soldier or around during 9-11. No. And she knows, she knows better than that. She's a train, she has a degree in, in therapy. And a master. No. I, I mean. Hmm. <laughs> And there are so many other things and maybe she's trying to relate it to the fact of like you you don't get to you know you don't get depression from something unless it's traumatic so maybe you weren't maybe it's not genetic or it's not you know kind of one you know one of those things like where depression is oh gosh <coughs> sorry you know it, it's god i'm trying to even all these words I feel like she's saying that the the pressure of, of something like being a soldier or being around during 9-11, those are things that could cause you to have depression. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure, I, I, absolutely, those two things could. But there are also a bazillion other things. A ba there are so many other things. So many other traumatic events. Um, situations that people are in that could cause depression. Like, I, I just, again, this interview is 11 years old. However, at, in 2011, let's, hold on, let me go back. Let me make sure I'm not saying this wrong. She, she had her, what degree did she have at this point in time? Let's see. So in 2013 is when she gained her master's degree um, but in 2006, she did a postgraduate certificate in psychotherapy and counseling. <coughs> so five years before, she had she had gone to she had gotten a postgraduate degree or certificate. She should know better. She should she should know better than that answer. I'm so, no, there's no excuse. There's no excuse for that answer. Um, and then this one, like this to me, like this next question. <clears throat> it it infuriates me to the point of how little 
she she thinks about a human being. Um, and it, the person, again, 2011, says, are you politically engaged? And she says, it depends on what time of the day it is. So I am not political. No, I mean, I think George Bush should have been assassinated, but for reasons of stupidity, that is. What? Again, is she trying to be funny? Because it's not. And it wouldn't have been funny in 2011 to say something like that. That, like, I, my, my, my brain hurts from this. Like, why? 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 I don't understand. And again, people can change. People can apologize. People can grow. And I 100%, if I could find something where I could tell that there had been a shift and a change, if I could talk to her and be like, hey, you said these things then. Can you, like, are your thoughts still the same? Are we still feeling like this? Do we still feel like this is appropriate? Um, like, kind of ways to behave and ways to say things? And, and maybe she would be like, yeah, I think it's fine. Well, then, okay. Then I'm, then I'm, I'm done. I, I don't. I'm not, I'm not with you then. I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna read your books. I'm not gonna do, no. Uh, but, but if I talked to her, you know, and, and she was like, oh my gosh, no, like, no, those were, those are things I should not have said. I don't feel that way. I don't think that way anymore. You know, I value human life. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, and I know that people have said this about, about, Every president, every president has had people say this stuff about them. But it's, you said this in an interview. And it's written. It was on the first page of the Google search. I mean, so I, I just... I just feel like it's it's very it's disrespectful. I think that's one of the big things that that for me, as far as Ruby, right, like just disrespectful in some of the things that she said, some of the ways that she said things or phrased things are just inappropriate or disrespectful. I'm gonna wrap this episode up because we've been going for a long time. Thank you for staying. Thank you for being part of this. Um, but final thoughts, right? Number one, I am glad. That Ruby is, though, out in the world fighting against the stigma of mental illness. We need more people to do that. As this is Mental Health Month, like Mental Health Awareness Month is the month of May, um, I think it's extremely important that there are people out there fighting to end the stigma of mental illness. Um, I am glad that she brought in experts to help her navigate these subjects, right? Talking with a neuroscientist about how the brain works, talking with a monk about how the, the meditation and mindfulness and the benefits of those kind of things. I think that that's a great partnership in bringing in to, to navigate these kind of topics. And I don't agree with everything she says or everything she does. And that's okay. I still respect her and the work that she does. And I think that is the key to how to be human. That's... That's my thought. I don't agree with everything she says or does, but I still respect her because she's a human. And that's what I'm going to do. So thank you for joining me today. Please make sure that you head over to Instagram uh, at, at M-S-H-E-A-T-H-E-R, the letter B, D-O-T, at Miss Heather B. Dot, or at connect the dots underscore podcast. That's where you can find me over on Instagram. Or if uh, you're not watching this on YouTube, uh, head over to YouTube and subscribe to the channel so you can get the video uh, alerts. <laughs> uh, and if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you do all the things, right? Click and like and subscribe and do all the rating things. Do all that stuff. <clears throat> um, join in the conversation, please. Let me know your thoughts on, on this. Because <laughs> it definitely, like, there were some really good things and there were some really bad things. And it just had my mind all like kind of crazy. So I'd love to know your thoughts about it too. 
Next week, we will head into a conversation on neurodiversity. Cannot wait for that. Um, Until then, remember that you are loved and you are worthy. And there are great things ahead for you in this life if you trust and believe in the Lord. We will see you next week, folks. Bye.